years ago, I was preaching a sermon at my former church, and then in the middle of the sermon, I made a point that apparently people liked because they started clapping, and, and that had happened a few times, not often, but people would say amen or they'd clap, but at this point, they clapped so much that I had to stop. I had to stop for like 10 seconds. Now, you might not know this about me, but I'm not somebody who like begs for amens, and I don't really look for that. In fact, I don't kind of, I'm uncomfortable when people amen, because when people amen, I stop and think, I wonder what I said that was so good. You know, and, and so I'm kind of a little bit uncomfortable with that, but this was such an interruption, I had to go back and listen, because I couldn't remember what they, what they had clapped for. And so I went back that afternoon, and I listened to the audio recording, and here's what I said. I'm tired of listening, or I'm tired of disrespectful people. I'm tired of people who, who think that other people owe them. I'm tired of people who game the system. I'm tired of people who don't make me guess whether they're wearing boxers or briefs. And then I yell, pull your pants up, you know, like that. And everybody stopped and clapped. And as I listened, I thought to myself, People have never stopped and clapped when I've asked them to forgive their ex. And people have never stopped and clapped when I asked them to forgive their daughter's ex. And people have never stopped and clapped when I said we shouldn't be greedy. And they've never interrupted my message whenever I said that we ought to, to give generously and to tithe, except maybe the finance committee did one time, but that's a completely different story. The reality is, it's a lot more fun to be critical of others than it is to examine ourselves. The Monday after the sermon, one of my members called me. And he said, Pastor, I understand your opinion of what you were sharing yesterday, but it bothered me that we went there as a church. He said, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you said, but the people you were talking about weren't there. And when we went there, we didn't go there because we wanted to help them. We went there because we were condemning them. Those words cut deep. Whether that was my intent or not, that's how it was perceived. And that's not the way kingdom citizens live. That was about the time that I started talking about my sin more from the pulpit than the sins of other people. A few weeks ago, I got an email from one of our church members, and I think they were joking, but they said, you talk a lot about your sin, Pastor, on, on, on Sundays. I'm making a list and checking it twice. <laughs> I think they were joking, I hope. <laughs> uh, but kingdom citizens don't spend their time judging others. If you've not been here, we're walking verse by verse through Matthew's chapter 5 through 7. Those three chapters uh, make up the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus contrasts the difference between a person who is a kingdom citizen and a person who is living a hypocritical, externally driven, uh, man-pleasing life. And Jesus talks about how different kingdom citizens are. They have attitudes that are, are, are unique. And they, uh, um, they have actions that are holy. But their actions are not just external. Kingdom citizens have pure hearts. And kingdom citizens don't live for the the praise of others and kingdom citizens are pure in their motives and kingdom citizens trust God even for the basic necessities of life. They, they trust him. In our section today, Jesus is going to talk about how kingdom citizens are different and how they think about others. He says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, maybe some of Jesus' most famous words, do not judge. Do not judge others so that you won't be judged. This word judge is a, uh, a translation of a Greek word called krino. If you've ever taken any Greek, you've learned the word krino because it's one of the most used uh, words in the Greek uh, New Testament. And the word krino is used in lots of occasions in life. Uh, sometimes 
It is uh, simply used to, to make a value assumption. Sometimes it's used to distinguish between good or bad. And this type of judgment, this type of crino happens all the time. We judge food values, and we judge an activity's worth, and we judge an outfit's appropriateness. And you can't live without judging. Uh, we, we have to make decisions. But Jesus' words are not about simply making basic life determinations. Jesus' words are about judging other people. When crino is used in context of people, it almost always carries with it the connotation of condemnation. And Jesus is teaching here in this passage that it's, it's just not appropriate for a person who is a kingdom citizen, a person who says they're in relationship with him to go around judging others. Now, of course, we know this. But what I found is this is often one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire New Testament. It's misapplied in two ways. Sometimes it's con uh, confused where people, you know, use this because they got their hand caught in the cookie jar. You know, they were doing something wrong and, and somebody calls them out and they'll throw it back at them. Hey, don't judge me. Jesus says, don't judge. If you've ever done that, I want you to understand you're misappropriating Jesus' words. Jesus never intended you to self-justify with his teaching. This verse can't be used to excuse bad behavior. It's not intended to get you off the hook. And whoever uses this verse in this way is compounding their sin and really is making a pretty weak argument. Uh, and if someone is judging you, and listen, people do judge us and they judge us inappropriately. But if someone is judging you, you can't use this verse to excuse your sinful behavior. Now, another problem that's more frequently found in the application of this text is, is if a person makes an evaluation of anything. Uh, they, some people would say, if you, if you make a determination about anything or anyone's activity, then you are breaking this command. If a person says that homosexuality is a sin and they teach their children that it's wrong, and they do not think that people should get rewarded for this type of behavior, they say, you're bigoted. And it doesn't matter how much you love even homosexuals or how well you treat them or if you do not discriminate or if you befriend, you're still breaking this command. You're judging. Or if a person's making a mess of their life and they're drinking too much and they're wasting their opportunity at school uh, and they're making decisions now that are lasting them for a lifetime and you're concerned and you go to them one-on-one -on -one and you say, hey, man, I'm worried about you. How dare you judge me? Who do you think you are? And I mean, what do we do with transgender? Everywhere right now, we're faced with this. And if you s say that people are confused and it's not healthy, and God created two genders, male and female, if you say that, some people believe that you're being incredibly judgmental. No, wh what do we do with that? Well, I think what has happened is we have confused judgment with judgmentalism. There's a difference between right judgment and judgmentalism. Uh, do not judge doesn't mean that we accept all practices and beliefs. The Bible says we're to test the spirits. The Bible says that we are to uh, hold on to what is good and to know the difference between good and bad. But we have to understand that how we test what is good and how we talk about the beliefs and practices of others is, is important. It's so easy for people to slip into judgmentalism where you move from their activity to their worth. Someone will say a transgender person is worthless or that kid with baggy pants is probably on drugs or I can't stand gay people. That's judgmental. That's what Jesus is talking about. Don't be that person. Don't be that person who looks down on others. Judgment, on the other hand, is evaluating a person's action. Using substances is dangerous. People who would tell you otherwise are foolish. Certain lifestyles are harmful. You need to recognize that. Rooting for Louisville is not a good choice. <laughs> You've got to be discerning and be able to tell what is sound judgment. But you can make right judgment with a critical judgmental attitude. And that's wrong. Being 
judgmental doesn't make your evaluation wrong. Being judgmental just makes you wrong. And when you have the Spirit, you're walking in a dangerous place. Because judgmental people are assuming the role of God. Listen to all of verse 1. Don't judge so that you won't be judged. Now, this is not teaching that if you never judge anyone, you're going to escape judgment yourself, but it is teaching that if you do judge, you're going to be judged for the action of judging, for your judgmentalism. James speaks of this. There's one lawgiver. You're not it. There's one judge. You're not it. He's able to save. He's able to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor and to look down on them and to condemn them? Yet most people feel free to do this all the time. Like it's not a big deal. It's a huge deal because when you start fault finding and, and when, when you start being critical of others, you start playing God. And God will not share his throne. But there's another reason why we shouldn't be judgmental. And that is you take the focus off of yourself. A lot of people look for faults in others simply to make themselves feel better. It's like watching something like the Jerry Springer show, you know? Well, at least my family's not that crazy, you know. But there's inherent problems in looking at the faults of others. And one of them is you forget your own faults. Jesus says in verse 2, for you will be judged by the standard with which you judge, and you'll be measured by the same measure you use. When you turn your focus on others, you have a tendency to forget that you're going to face this same judgment. People are more than willing to judge others and not apply that same standard to themselves. And we can judge the sexual activities of another, and we excuse or ignore our own lusts. And we can judge the gossip of another and we excuse the repet repetition of a sensitive subject as just seeking wise counsel. Or we can look at the anger of another person and we can think, how could they be so rude? And then we excuse our spewing off as just, well, I needed to let off some steam. It's really hypocritical. And notice the word choice here in verse 2. He talks about the standard, which kind of gives an indication of, 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 of weights on a scale. It's talking about severity. Some sin seems really big. Some sin seems little. If you were raised Catholic, you might have heard of mortal and venial sins. Some are really, really bad. Some, you know, they might just cause you to have a little bad luck, but they're not as big. And yet Jesus says, be careful, those of you who want to uh, use this standard against another. Jesus says, my standard will be applied to all, and his standard is not one that's focused on externals. His standard is the heart. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know, you judge other people because they murder. And he says, yet I say to you, if your heart goes to that anger where you want to get even, you're already there. You judge people because of adultery. But if you look and lust, you're there. That's what Jesus teaches. That's the standard that gets applied. The other word he uses is the measure. The me measure is a little different. It's kind of the, it's the amount of the kind of the same stuff, substance. You know, it's the, the, the uh, we, we kind of excuse our sins by saying things like, you know, I speed, you know, like if I'm late to work or if I have an emergency, but some people drive like an idiot all the time. You know, that's different. If you get caught up in the judgment game, Jesus says, it'll come back to haunt you because Jesus judges by his standard, not yours and not mine. And he looks inside your heart. And even though we're kingdom citizens, we're in no position to stand in judgment of others. If you're here for the first time today, I want, you to make, I want to make sure you understand the gospel message we preach. We don't preach that any of us here are good enough to go to heaven because we showed up to church, because we put on our Sunday clothes, and because we sing certain songs, or because we give money to church. We believe we go to heaven because of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ alone. 
We don't believe that we are better than people, or at least we shouldn't believe that we're better than people because we proclaim every week that it is the mercy of Jesus displayed on the cross that paid the price for our salvation that enables us to be right with God. And it's only through faith we have that, not because we're good, not because we showed up, or not because we were generous, or not because we were charitable, or not because we did anything. It is not of our merit that we are right with God. Rather, it's his mercy that makes us right with him. And for that reason alone, we shouldn't be judged judgmental that we're in people in debt we are people in desperate need of mercy now there's another reason we should avoid judging that jesus talks about and that's the fact that you just look silly doing it in verse three jesus says why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye and you don't notice the beam in your own i think jesus is trying to be humorous here and i think he is being humorous imagine a person with a magnifying glass and trying to look out their right eye and their brothers at their brother's eye and seeing the speck all the while they're ignoring this two by four that's almost hitting the person they're looking at because they're examining them so closely it's ridiculous and yet that's what we do. We have a tendency to notice the smallest things about people around us and excuse major flaws in our own lives or even worse, not even notice our own flaws. Then as we talk about others, we don't see the irony in our judgment. One person at church I served called me and they told me about another person in the church had been extremely hateful to them. And it was a serious issue. And it shouldn't be taken lightly, and I wasn't going to take it lightly, and I was going to give it attention, but the irony was not lost on me that I received a lot of emails from this person complaining about the church. And they almost always seemed hateful to me. <laughs> How many times do judgmental people look like the person, the proverbial pot that calls the kettle black? Matthew 7, 4. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye. Jesus moves from noticing the speck to the brazen act of correcting. And in this instance, the person with the obvious problem is looking at another who has a small problem and says, hey, let me help you out. It'd be like me coming up to some of y'all who are maybe five or ten pounds overweight and says, hey, man, you might need to look at this stuff. You know, you're getting a little bit unhealthy now. I mean, it would be ridiculous if I were to do that. be hypocritical and Jesus says that's exactly what goes on when we fault find uh, and are critical of others he says first take the beam out of your own eye uh, deal with your issues first and, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye and that's something about judgmentalism, that we, a danger that we don't often think about. But here's the problem. We're to be light and salt in the world. We're to make different, a, a difference in the world. But, but if we're judgmental and looking down on people all the time, we lose the ability to be helpful in who we're supposed to be. Your advice to someone is much more credible if it's not in conflict with your life. Now, I know dealing with another person's issues is not fun, but we should want to help a brother who has a problem. And it's our job. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone's overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person. Now, notice the passage tells you how to restore them. With a gentle spirit. Some people appropriately point out that the passage in Matthew uh, doesn't say that we should never deal with other people's sins. And they're right. But I want you to all acknowledge today is the main point of Jesus' teaching and do not judge so that you can figure out how to help other people or is the main point to make sure that you're looking at your own life first. What I've found, if you see your own faults, that's going to make you more humble. If you focus on yourself first, you're going to be more patient with the others. If you've undergone spiritual surgery and had to recover, you're going to be cautious in how you use the scalpel on others. Now, there's debate over this next verse, and to be honest, it's hard, and I hope I share it more clearly with you in this service than I did in the last service. Uh, but verse 6 is hard. Uh, all of the Sermon on the Mount kind of makes sense. I hope this far, you, you, that's far you can kind of see. Man, this is just stacking on top of one another. It's going to continue, but then verse 6 comes in, and nobody knows where to put it because it doesn't seem to belong. 
Uh, verse 6 says, Don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before pigs, or they will trample them under your feet, uh, turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what, what is going on here? Well, some people believe that Jesus is talking about sharing the gospel. Jesus is obviously not telling us to not share good news with people. I'm just telling you, that is not consistent with the New Testament. Others think he's talking about dealing with ungrateful people. You remember what Jesus says to the missionaries, hey, when you go out, if people don't welcome you, you know, you kind of kick the dust off your feet and don't cast, kind of the don't cast your pearls before swine. Uh, I don't think that's it either. Uh, I'm really not sure. But, and here's what I want you to think through. If this verse is connected to do not judge, which I think it might be, if it's connected to, to do not judge, maybe Jesus was talking to the hypocrites, those who love to be seen, like in Matthew 6, the religious people who practice their holiness to be praised by others, who would judge others and yet not judge themselves. If he's talking to them, maybe he's saying, your actions are not your problem. Your actions are holy, but it's your sinful heart that is the problem. And when you judge others by what you can see and you justify yourselves only by what they can see, you're giving your holy actions to the dogs of your sinful heart. You're tossing the pearls of goodness before your own sinfulness. Living holy only to judge others is dangerous. I hope you hear that because I'm, I'm, this isn't the kid who's out there who's not paying any attention today. This is the religious people in the room. If we're showing up here so that we can condemn others who don't, it is dangerous for your soul. Incredibly dangerous for your soul. It can cause your soul to be torn to pieces. Destruction can happen. Damage can be done. This is one of the real dangers of judgmentalism. We start thinking we're okay and we start buying what we're selling and our better-than-you critical mindset hurts our soul. It hurts our soul because you don't realize how far away from God you are. I mean, that's, that's how it hurts your soul. You start comparing yourself to other people who are just as flawed, and truthfully, in some areas, they may be more flawed than you. And because you justify yourself by looking at others and comparing yourself to others, you don't cry out to God for help because you don't think you need it as bad as those folks. And Jesus is saying, oh, be careful. If you do this, you could end up giving what is holy to the dogs. I know nobody wants to be a judgmental person, so let's talk about how you, can how you can avoid a judgmental spirit. First, I think the best thing you can do today is acknowledge that you're not God. Condemning others is clearly reserved for the, the sovereign. God is fully capable of doing his job. He can save, he can destroy, and he can make rules. And it sounds so simple to acknowledge that we're not God, that we're not the creator, and we're not all wise, and we're not able to change much. But could you also acknowledge you're not God in your ability to judge what is okay and not okay? Because here's what I found. I can so quickly move from the Word of God to the opinions of Nick. And I can really quickly treat them as equal. I can start to think my culture is better than another culture. I can start to think that my views of how to manage this life are better than other people's views of how to manage this life. Now, when it runs parallel to the Word, praise the Lord. But what I found is a lot of people try to shove their political, social, cultural opinions on the Word of God. Be careful. You're not God. Judgmentalism reveals pride in your heart. A lack of humility will invariably lead to a critical attitude of others, and those who are not humble will try to humble other people. And so I encourage you to focus on yourself. When you see a flaw in others, first look inside. Own your part. Take responsibility. 
Don't use other people's shortcomings as a diversion from your own. I'm kind of going through a hard time right now and in and, and dealing with a hard issue. And there is a, every part of me wants to look externally and go to what others might have done wrong. And you got to deal with that. But that's not step one. Step one is to look at your heart and say, how did I add? What have I done? Where am I in the wrong? Focus on your own sin. So we're, we got like three more weeks left in the Sermon on the Mount. And I end up in the same place every week because Sermon on the Mount's beautiful. I mean, you read this and it's poetic and it's engaging and it, it, it deals with, with this v vast array of life situations. And when I read the Sermon on the Mount, I think I love it. And then when I read it, I think, oh my goodness, I don't love it because it exposes me really bad. And it shows how far short of God's standards that I fall. I love what Jesus says, but then I'm reminded of my failures in every part of the sermon. It just constantly peels the onion of my soul and it reveals that I'm so far in my own flesh from what God expects. But here is what I know. He has the right every right to judge me and I can't argue with a guilty verdict but the one who could condemn extends mercy and instead of judging us he takes judgment on himself and the price we should have paid, Jesus bore that on his shoulders on the cross. And when he cried out, paid in full, he's talking about every failure for every human being who will put their faith and trust in him. And the condemnation that should have come to us was laid on him. And that's the cure for judgmentalism. See, the cure for judgmentalism is not, hey, show up and do better. The cure for judgmentalism is to bow before the cross and recognize he hung on the cross. He suffered. He bled. He died because of your sin. And when you start thinking about where you are and what you've done, and even what you've done since you acknowledged what he has done, that should humble you. And that should keep you from having a condescending spirit. Realize that God has shown mercy to you. Jesus told a parable of a man who owed a lot, lifetimes worth of money. And it was time to pay. And he had no means. The man that he owed the debt to said, You're going to have to settle. If you can't pay, I'll have to sell you and your family, uh, your kids, all your possessions, and I'll even lock you up just to prove a point. And the man who owed so much fell and begged for mercy and said, please, please don't do this. Please have mercy on me. The, the man who was owed had compassion on the one who pleaded for mercy. What a beautiful picture of what God has done for us. But then that same man was owed pennies. The one who had been forgiven went out and found one who owed him just a small amount and said, you need to pay up and you need to pay up now. If not, I'm going to have you thrown in jail. And the guy said, no, please have mercy on me. I'll pay it back. Give me time. Please have mercy. And he wouldn't have mercy. And Jesus said, that's not who my followers are. My followers aren't the type of people who are critical and vengeful. My followers are merciful. So I encourage you, be merciful to others and do not judge. Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit 
would take these words of mine and somehow turn them into words that you can use in people's hearts. As I've accurately preached your word, I pray that it would have its effect. And Lord, if I failed at any point, I pray that you would clarify to the heart of a believer. That God, I pray that you would help us to be people who are first and foremost confessors of our sin. And God, I thank you that we can also make another confession that your mercy is capable to cleanse us of our sin and make us right with you. And God, while we're not perfect in our following of you, you have been perfect in your love of us. Thank you, God, that you're a covenant-keeping God and that your mercy does endure forever. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Mm -hmm.